Welcome to Vape News Radio, the voice of vaping. In each show, we share the latest about regulations and things you need to know, plus upcoming conferences and fests, along with interviews with the movers and shakers in this fabulous vape space. Are you looking to get into this ever-expanding marketplace? Do you want to master this industry? Listen up as Norm Bauer, the vape mentor, shares it all. And here's your host, Norm Bauer. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Norm Bauer with Vape Radio, your voice of vape. I am sitting here with Curry Lamb. He is with Council of Vapor. This is a company that you probably have heard about but wasn't quite sure, and I'm not going to go into any explanation about who they are. I'm going to go right to the source and ask them. So, Curry, welcome to Vape Radio. Thank you for having me. So, tell us, what is Council of Vapor? Council of Vapor is really the a hardware company for the people. We do things where people may charge, let's say, a couple hundred dollars for a device or Addy or anything like that, but we want to make the same quality but give it to you for affordable prices for the people. All right, so I'm not quite sure I understand. So let's just say that I have this idea, this concept for developing a brand new mod, but I'm not an engineer. I just think that I have an idea of what it should look like. Do I come to you or how? what do I need to deliver to you in order to make this a viable conversation? What we do is we take input from the people, from our peers, and we actually create devices and make sure that it's first affordable for the mass, but we don't lose in quality. And so how do you determine if it's going to be affordable? Is it based on the simplicity or the complexity of the design? No, affordability is is practicality. Average person spending hundreds of dollars on a device or mod, it's not reasonable for them to, if they break it, they're able to afford another one. Got it. So for as long as I've been in the industry, which is about two years, I've seen incredible advances in hardware. And you, I understand, have been involved in the industry even longer, right? Yes, I've been in the industry for quite a while since the Carter Meister days. All right. So you've seen a lot of advances in hardware. I mean, the e-liquid market is a whole different conversation, which we don't need to get into, because other than the fact that the regulations are more tight and there's more scrutiny about the manufacturing process. It pretty much is what it is, and it's probably not going to change too much. But the hardware industry, you know, I just did an interview for a magazine, and I asked three different people, what is the biggest challenge that you had this year in 2015? And all three of them had the exact same answer, and they were challenged trying to keep up with the changes in hardware. And a lot of that is because the manufacturers kept coming up with upgrades and I don't know whether these upgrades are critical upgrades or whether they're just modifications that people are making. So talk to us about the hardware side that you've seen over the last several years and why things have gotten so bloody complicated. Everyone is just trying to make as much money as possible. That's what I see. From our perspective, we want to really work on getting good products out there. So we spend lots of time on our products. We basically, if we launch anything, we do it maybe once or twice a year. Comparison to a lot of people, which will do it about maybe every three months or less. And I think some of these things that they do, I'm not saying everyone does it, is we are using the public as uh, beta testers. Okay. If you could say that, because they see what's wrong then they'll change it right away. Now, Council of Vapor actually does manufacture its own line of hardware for yourself, including some very well-known and popular designs, right? Yes. So can you share with us what those names would be? Our Royal Hunter has been probably one of the fastest-selling RDAs, I guess, this year. We launched it literally probably, I think, in January, and it did tremendously well, and it's still doing well. At ECC recently, we just launched the mini version of it, the Royal Hunter Mini. And that's phenomenally taking off right now. We have a lot of pre-orders for that. And we've had a lot of people cloning us. So that means that, you know, imitation takes off form. That means we're doing pretty well also. Well, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But unfortunately, this whole clone issue, which we're going to get to in just a moment, is a major, major problem in the industry. So what is it about the Royal Hunter that makes it so popular? What is it doing better than its competition? I think we created a atomizer for the cloud chasing people, but also that you can actually get flavor out of it because of the way we created the airflow. We also made sure that it was affordable, but still looked extremely elegant and done very tastefully. Okay, so what is the retail price for this Royal Hunter? Royal Hunters and Royal Hunter Minis go retail around $45. Okay, and what other lines have you manufactured under Council of Vapor that people might be familiar with? 
We've done our two mods, the Kindred 2s, the Kindreds. Um, we've done the Aries Pro Drip Atomizer for Taste. We've done a Typhoon tank, and we just came out with a new Vengeance tank. That one is a cloud chasing tank that's uh, going to hit people pretty soon. Okay. Now, can you share about how many different lines that you have made based on someone else's design, like company A, company B, company C comes to you and they say, we want to manufacture this. About how many have you actually taken to full production? Done maybe a little over a dozen of other people's things, but you know we can't disclose that. No, I understood. Now, I'm guessing a lot of these people come to you with a design that either one is impractical or two is just not worthy or just not different enough in the marketplace. So tell us about the people who come to you with a design and what is your criteria to determine whether you decide to move on this or not? Because obviously you have a vested interest too because you're manufacturing it and you don't want to manufacture something that's not going to sell. It's not really that anyone has any bad ideas. It's more like, is it functional and is it safe? So we do have a team of over 25 engineers that actually... 25 engineers? Yes. Wow. So we do have people that know at least practicalities and, you know, engineering aspects. I don't know that. I am what you call like those beta testers. I look at it, I test it, I try it out, see if it makes sense for us as a vapor. You know, as far as safety and everything is concerned, I leave that to the engineers. So can you actually create a better mousetrap? I mean, is there such a thing? Because, you know, vaping has so many different aspects for it. You know, you've got the mechanicals where they started. You've got the egos. You've got the drips. You've got all these different things. I mean, there's so many different subsets and different channels of the vaping industry that there's no one design that's going to work for everyone. So, you know, is there an area of specialization that Count of, Council of Vapor really primarily focuses on? We focus on making sure that this can be quality, mass-produced products. I believe we can make things that everyone wants to buy, make sure that it's for people, and it's functional. You know, we, we trust everything we make, so make sure that it doesn't have problems. And if there is problems that we find out from the public, we do things to, you know, remedy that. So I can speak personally of how this process works because it just so happens that I'm involved with a consortium in Southern California that had a very unique, very innovative design called Latitude. And you're going to be seeing this launch before the end of the year, so that's a little hint in advance. But these guys came up with a very, very revolutionary idea. I introduced them to council. They came up here and we looked at it, and they decided this truly was innovative and very revolutionary, and now we're going to be taking it to market. So how often does something come to you that you say, holy cow, why didn't I think of that, or how come no one else brought us that design? I mean, is there truly still room for innovation in the hardware market? I believe there is. I think a lot of people think of things, but they don't think all the way through to make sure that is it really functional. So their ideas may, I think everyone has a lot of the similar ideas, but no one knows how to put it into paper and draw it out. Well, you know what? That's the nature of entrepreneurship. I mean, I've known lots and lots of people over the years who say, Oh, this such and such came out, and I thought about that two years ago. Well, thinking about things doesn't make things happen, and the reality of it is action speaks louder than words. So there's probably a lot of people who are listening right now. So if you are an engineer, if you are an avid vapor, and if you have an idea that you think has some viability, if it's different enough, it's unique enough, you think that there's a marketplace for it, so obviously they're going to get a hold of you at Council of Vapor, right? So what do they come up with? I mean, you have this cliche about coming in with a napkin, you know, with a design on the back. What do you need to work with? You don't need a CAD drawing or you don't need anything that really requires engineering skills to move forward on. Can people just come into you and kind of describe what they want? Because that seems rather vague. They can because we've had experience with vapes and devices all the time. So they can come to us and we can probably draw it out and see if it meets their criteria. Hmm. And so how much would it cost someone to come to you with an idea, with a concept approximately, to be able to take it to your engineers and say, is this a viable design? Is this something that you think has a applicability in the marketplace? Well, any meetings doesn't cost a thing, right? So it's nothing to do with uh, money when we talk about meetings. Okay. You know, 
I have a meeting with you all the time. <laughs> well, understood. So I'm here in Southern California, which is where you are as well. So if I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I have this idea, do I just set up a Skype call with you and say, here's a picture of my design and you tell me whether you think it's viable? I mean, how do you work with people remotely on such a thing? Or if they're serious enough, do they need to come out and meet with you? I mean, if they're serious enough, they would come out and meet with us. You know, we sit down, you know, we take care of all the NDAs or whatnot and, you know, make sure that what's theirs is theirs and what's ours is ours. All right. So let's talk about that because that's obviously a huge issue. We have a problem in the industry with plagiarization, with cloning. And, you know, you told me earlier today that there's people out there that are cloning your own proprietary devices and you've got an army of team, a SWAT team that literally goes out and shuts them down. So you have to be very aggressive to make sure that your idea is not copied. So when someone comes to you with an idea, you're signing an MDA that stands for, by the way, that's a non-disclosure agreement for those of you who are not familiar with the term. It basically protects you. So if you have an idea, that's what they call intellectual property. That means you have an idea. They are promising that they're going to you know, not do anything with it, and you're going to promise that you're going to keep it here private as well. So that's what the purpose of an NDA is. So they're coming to you, and let's just say that you guys determined that this is a viable design. What kind of minimums would they have to order from you in order for you to take this to full production? Because now you're going beyond talking. Talk is fairly inexpensive. So someone comes to you, you've put your designers on it, they determine that this is a viable idea, and they say, great, thumbs up, let's move forward on it, let's go ahead and manufacture. First, you have to build a prototype, right? Yes. And so any idea, can you kind of give us an idea about what a prototype might be? And I know it varies depending upon the simplicity or complexity of it. Prototypes, to be honest, for us, we don't charge for prototypes. Because if our relationship is very good, then we're going to create something together and it's really a for us a trust issue and knowing who we're meeting with you know if anyone just comes up to us then maybe we'll have to charge for a prototype all right so that's a very unusual take in today's gimme 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 take 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 world so basically what you're saying is if i come to you i come in with a design we both feel it's feasible you are willing to put skin in the game by creating a prototype with me for no money based on the fact that you believe this product will sell yes that is extraordinary. And again, for those of you who are listening, if you have an idea for a product, I want you to make a note of that. So let's just say that we make a prototype, we put it out in beta tests, and we find out that it's okay, or maybe it needs a few tweaks, and everything is ready to go to market. What do I need to order from you in order to meet your, I mean, do you have MOQs, minimum orders? Yes, we do. I mean, that's something we normally discuss with the client, because it's based upon what it is, the MOQ might be higher or lower. Okay. Now, do you also help them with distribution? We can actually do that also, but in, that's a completely different thing than <laughs> okay. what we do right now. So. Got it. Yeah. So here's what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Let's just say that you are someone who's well-connected on social media. Maybe you are an e-liquid manufacturer and you already have a good database of clients, or maybe you are a brick-and-mortar shop and you've got a database of customers, You know, and you come up with this idea, you bring it to Council of Vapor, you both decide this is a feasible idea. You go ahead and create a prototype. You literally can go to market within you know, a relatively short period of time. So if I came to you on day one and we determined this is a viable product, about how long would it be before we were ready to, quote, unquote, take it to market after the pro- – let's just say the prototype was fully functional. Are we talking about several months? No, maybe within a month or two. Wow. Well, that's extraordinary. And the agreement that you have with whoever brings you these models is obviously you want to be the manufacturing party. That's why you're doing it. Correct. But are you doing any type of revenue sharing or partnering or anything? Or basically you are totally hands off. They have proprietary rights to the property and you just manufacture and you come up with a manufacturing agreement and that's all there is to it. Yeah. Pretty much, I guess. Yeah. All right. Sure. <laughs> so, so for those of you who are listening, and again, we have a worldwide market. This is an extraordinary model. You can't go to a Kanger. You can't go to an Inican. You can't go to a Joytech. You can't go to these companies with a design because they have their own thing, and they aren't going to want to do anything other than their own thing. They already have their posture in the marketplace. So for those of you out here, and I talk to you guys all the time, There's a lot of brilliant vapreneurs out there who have great concepts for business models. And what I always say about this industry is that the vape space is very generous 
to vapreneurs, but it's very unforgiving if you do it wrong. But the reality of it is, is that this is a virtually no risk type of deal. If you have an idea for mod and you bring it to Council of Vapor here, they're willing to take a look at you and they'll either say, this idea does not work, thank you, keep trying, or they'll say, this idea does work and maybe it's good as it is or maybe we just need to fine tune it. So this is why I'm interviewing Council of Vapor because I'm looking for people that are offering something different and unique and information that you guys need to know about. So, you know, we at Vape Mentors, we pride ourselves on being a resource. We are, you know, find all the thought leaders. So when I heard about what these guys were doing, I went, seriously, this is what you do? So what are the next missions for Council of Vapor? I mean, is this going to be a big part of your market as far as developing new lines of hardware for various brilliant engineers out there? I mean, developing for people, it's only on if they want to do. I mean, we ourselves, you know, develop our own products all the time. We take time to do it. We've been working on several various projects the past two years. They're just not ready for the marketplace. So in a short time, the next quarter, we'll probably be launching some devices that we have never launched before. So let me ask you, one thing we haven't talked about is private labeling. Let's just say that you already have something in your inventory in the way of a starter kit. And I want to create a starter kit for ABC Vape Shops, which is what I own. And I've got a chain of four vape shops. And rather than sell a name brand out there, I want to create my own. Can I come to you and say, oh, I like Model B over there. Can I go ahead and private label that with you and then have my name on that vape? Yes. If it's something that we don't have in the marketplace for our own current you know, devices, then yes, you could most likely do that. Wow. All right, guys. Well, listen, you heard it here on Vape Radio. So we're talking about hardware today. We're talking with Curry Lamb from Council of Vapor. And what they do is that they manufacture hardware. They'll manufacture your lines either to spec or they will modify their designs to your name. So, you know, this is a very, very unusual model. And that's why I wanted to meet with them. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. So is there anything that we have not talked about that you think that our audience should know about, Curry? I guess for our products, especially when we're talking about all the clones out there and everything like that, to know that if you have a legitimate council paper product, we do have a key card or serial key in and registry for our products in each individual product. And you can register to them online so you know that you have a valid product. Okay, so... I was going to actually bring this interview to an end, but I do want to talk about the cloning issue because when I first started in the industry a couple of years ago, a lot of shops were carrying clones. I am finding that less shops are carrying clones. They are becoming a little bit more out of favor. And a lot of that is because cost of productions have come down to the point of where there's not much price variation. So from your personal standpoint, I'm sure you have your views on clones. And also, what do you think that the market views about clones? That's where, you know, depending on what the devices are, that's why we also, like we said, we make sure that the prices are affordable. We want to make sure that the products out there are cost effective, not only for the, you know, consumers, but for the shops that carry them. Okay. Well, I think we've pretty much covered all of the bases. So again, this is Norm Bauer with Vape Radio here with Curry Lamb with Council of Vapor. And Curry, we thank you so much for joining our show. And we look forward to hopefully finding some of our listeners for you that have innovative designs and bringing them in. And hopefully you can create the next really awesome, amazing product out there. And we can say, hey, you know what? This is something that we helped create and made happen. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Norm. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Norm Bauer with Vape Radio. Do not go away. We're going to be right back. 